you, Patrick. How wonderful to be together. This is a joy. <clears throat> Please take it as a joy and not as a... Um, uh, it's not bad to, to handle coming together as an obligation. There are many things that are well handled as an obligation. But that can become drudgery if that's all it is. Uh, take it as, a, as an opportunity, especially, especially as an opportunity given to you by God. Every day we should get up and look and see, how can I serve God today? What does he give me opportunity to do? Who is going to come across my path that I can show his love and his light and his purpose? And it gives us a meaning. But how much more today in that we're gathering as the body of Christ, that in this setting, in this setting, we don't come to be filled. In this setting, we come to do our part. Like a, like a sports team or an acting company coming together. Those are very temporary, and, uh, and the purpose and meaning of those uh, endeavors are very, very temporary. But we have an eternal meaning, but yet each one of us has a specific part to fulfill. Let's do it together. We're going to finish the lesson we started last week. But before we do that, let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy Father, precious Lord, dear God, how awesome you are. Father, help us to, to truly be uh, active and alert and aware um, as your children of what you offer us of what you've done for us, of what you promise us, of what you uh, every day uh, give for us to do. Thank you for all the good works, countless in front of us, uh, that you have laid out. And we pray that we can be active in good works, that we can be active in, in seeking that which is good, that we can be people who love one another, that we can be people who... who Look for ways to connect and serve uh, and uh, bless. Father, help us this morning as we open up your word that we can get out of that which we ought, that we can be humble before it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we started in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we really skimmed the first several chapters. And remember we talked about the metaphor, the the, the magnificent metaphor that coming out of Egypt, coming across the desert and into the promised land, how much of a metaphor that is for our life in Christ. And it's not, a, it's not an accident all the way back uh, before the beginning of time, but you can see God's hand working in, in uh, the, the selling of Joseph into slavery as a, as a setup. One man sent to, sent to Egypt as a setup for the rest of his family getting there safely and well, for his entire nation to be set up there in Egypt, and then for this great uh, uh, rescue out of the then corrupt uh, pharaohs and across the desert. Don't forget, and go back to Deuteronomy 1.1, don't forget, verse 2 tells us it's an 11-day journey that it took him 40 years to do. It's an 11-day journey, and God let, uh, took them uh, over a 40-year pathway to get those 11 days. And that's a metaphor for life. If you could learn now those things which are so important, if, if, if somebody would lay them out in front of you and say, look at this, and you would now catch on to say, I got it. I understand. God would save a lot of time in your life, but we're not tend to be, we don't tend to be like that. We tend to say, I don't, I got things to do. Excuse me. I want to go have some fun. I'm, I'm busy. Let me learn those lessons later. Many of you have met my brother. Uh, my older brother, Rick, is here. Both my brothers are older than I, but Rick and his wife, Jan, are here. He used to write me letters. He took a serious step of faith in his young adult life before I did. And he used to write me letters from his military assignments. 
and his letters were on long uh, yellow paper, and it was, Dear Robert, da 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 and he would write these things, and then he would start with Scripture. And I'd say, oh, how nice, I got a letter from Rick. And I'd open it up, and it'd say, Dear Robert, you know, we're doing okay, how are you? Nice to And then he said, I was reading the Bible the other day. And then I'd start skipping. Bible, Bible, Bible. Oh, here he's talking again. And then I'd read what he had to say. And then he probably mentioned another Bible thing, and I'd skip that. And then it was answer, 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 love, Rick. If we would just pay attention. I wish I had those letters. I'd love to know what he said. He does, probably doesn't remember what he said. How much time we could save wandering in the desert if we would pay attention to the lesson God has for, lessons God has for us. But, but really, it's part of the lesson to learn how thick skulled we are, to learn that lesson along with all the other lessons. We just sang for number 413, the third verse of that says something like, as we talked about this metaphor, as I stand on the verge of Jordan, that's not exactly what it says, uh, help me through the swelling current, or whatever. Well, they didn't walk through a swelling current, remember? We read this last week, they walked over dry ground. But it's still the same metaphor as we get to Canaan's side. Just get me to Canaan. It's a metaphor for our entire life to be rescued out of bondage, to, to learn of God as we wander in the wilderness, to be in the promised land, Canaan, for all eternity with our Heavenly Father. Then we read Isaiah 66, or actually it was the other way around. We read Isaiah before then. But turn back to Isaiah 66. We talked about how uh, out of Deuteronomy we get meaning, meaning in life. And what you have, I was thinking, thinking about what Randy said during the Lord's Supper. Randy talked about the blessings we have. One of the greatest blessings we have Obviously, nothing compares to the blessing that is Christ and our salvation in him, giving us relationship with God. But in that, you have the blessing of meaning. You have the blessing of meaning in life. A life without meaning is so empty. It's a scramble to find the reason for doing the next day's work. It was uh, Troy that mentioned Sisyphus, the, the mythological figure who's given a stone to roll up to the top of the hill, and, is, and he works and he works and he works and he gets the stone to the top of the hill, and then it goes crashing down to the bottom of the hill again, and then he goes back down to get the stone, and he rolls up to the top of the hill. That's the way life is without God. That's the way life is without meaning. And what... what uh, what a person will do who doesn't have a faith is they'll try to put meanings into the little things. Like, you roll to the top of the hill and say, all right, I'm going to hold a stone here and maybe I'll build something out of, I'll build a hut out of this and other stones. What for? Well, so that the people who are rolling stones to the top of the hill will have a place to rest. What for? Would you stop asking what for? This little hut's meaning is about all I got right now. You see, you try to manufacture meaning in day-to-day -day existence. When in fact, overall, there is none. Well, in Christ, overall, there's tremendous meaning. And what we do, and what we're learning here from, from Deuteronomy and then back to Christ in just a second, is that we, it, it gets infused into everything we do. In meaning, we talked about last week how you give get uh, items of, of origin, purpose, morality, and destiny. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What's right and wrong to do? And where am I going? That's meaning. If you can answer those questions, if your uh, life direction and your walk and your uh, a faith answers those questions as Scripture does, as our Heavenly Father does. Look at Isaiah 66, what, what uh, we read this morning, the very end of the book of Isaiah. We're going to go into Romans to start next week. 
Thus says the Lord, verse 1, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. When there is a house that you could build, where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declared the Lord. Where did you come from? God over and over and over and over and over again tells you that you are from him, as is the universe. He is the origin and the meaning behind the universe. Verse uh, uh, 21 or 22 of the same chapter. For thus, for just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I, which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. There's the two brackets of our meaning. Origin and destiny. We have an eternity that endures with God. I made all of the cosmos and the universe, all the heavens and the earth I made, and I'm also making the new heavens and the new earth. That kind of blessing we don't catch on, and I hope our young couples and our teenagers catch on that life infused with this deep meaning is well worth living and enjoying and rejoicing in because we have a heavenly father. Now, back to, uh, uh, to Deuteronomy. What we have from, from the very beginning of Deuteronomy, the entire book, as we said, is nearly all Moses talking to the people just before they cross the Jordan. Chapter one, we already highlighted the beginning. Uh, in 11 days, it's an 11 day journey that only took him 40 years. Chapter two, look at the beginning of chapter two. When we turned and set out for the wilderness, he recounts the details of their path, reminding them of what they've done, of what they've been doing. Chapter three, look at uh, verses 20 and 21 and 22, uh, or rather 20 and 21. Until the Lord gives rest to your fellow countrymen as to you, they will also possess the land which the Lord your God will give them beyond the Jordan. And then you may return every man to his, to his possession which I have given you. I commanded Joshua at that time saying, your eyes have seen all the Lord your God has done the, to these two kings. So the Lord shall do to the kingdoms to which they were here cross. Do not, you are about to cross. Do not fear them. For the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. His reminder to, the, to, the, to his nation is you are my people and I'm on your side, as it will. I am preparing you away. I am uh, 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 bringing victory. Now, this was, was military and physical victory. But remember the metaphor we have. That God is watching us and caring for us and leading us. Okay, chapter 4, verse 23. So watch yourselves that you do not forget. Okay, so we had, he, he put these 40 years in front of you. They entered into the wilderness. The Lord is, is caring for them on the way to make sure uh, that they're not destroyed as a people. So verse 23 of chapter 4, So watch your, yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Our God is jealous for his relationship with us. Now, we handle jealousy as a negative thing, and in our hands, jealousy is mostly negative because it's fraught with uh, selfishness and mistrust and, uh, and, and exaggeration. But in God's hand, in a perfect loving God, he says, I want you for me only. I don't, I'm not going to share you with anybody. I'm not going to share you with any uh, sin. I'm not going to share you with any other faith. I'm not going to share you with any other God. You are mine. Don't make any image that's going to pull you 
away from me. Verse 29, from there you will seek the Lord. He tells, you're going to leave me. You're going to turn from me. And, and uh, uh, verse 28, you will serve God's. The work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. Now in verse 24, we just got a warning of how dangerous God is. Now in verse 28, he tells us, you're going to leave me. Followed that is 29. From there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. And when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. We don't just have a God who's warning us and jealous before us. We have a God who lovingly embraces us and brings us home as he teaches the Israelites. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 we read through last week and saw how God gave meaning, uh, uh, holiness as it were, to all parts of our lives exampled in the Ten Commandments. Chapter 5 recounts the Ten Commandments that had long before been given to Moses. And we see how God himself and our, his name and our relationship with him is sacred. He talks about us and our relationship with each other is sacred. He talks about us and the way we approach things, our thoughts about property and people is sacred. How we handle truth is sacred. He infuses meaning into the things they were to do. Now, chapter 6. Chapter 6. We know chapter 6 because we enjoy reading it and encouraging it, and it talks beautifully about our own families. Verse 4, hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it, then it shall be, come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your forefathers, to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Your blessing before God is Un, this indescribably wonderful. He wants us to see it and know it and, and participate in it. Verse 13, you shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the people who surround you. For the Lord your God is in the midst of you, is a jealous God. Otherwise, otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him in Manasseh. The constant flow back and forth as God reveals his character and puts in front of the people the purpose and meaning and, and direction and walk in their life. They had all four items for meaning in their life well and clearly answered. Origin, purpose, morality, and destiny. Now, we get... We, last week we talked about chapter 7. The Lord did not set up his... Uh, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number, etc., etc. How... His love for the people was because he had uh, selected them. It was because he had promised their forefathers. All right, chapter 8. 
All the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do. And this is what Patrick just read for us. Now, I promised you last week that we would connect these, this beautiful description, this beautiful preparation. And I really encourage you to read this. We can really only skim quickly over this. I would connect it to a great New Testament event, a, a huge New Testament event. And if you'll turn to me, turn... If you'll turn with me to Matthew 4, you'll do a lot better if you turn to the Word, not turn to me. Turn to Matthew 4, beginning in chapter 1. I mean, I'm going to go sit down, walk back up here, and start this all over again. Matthew 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the, the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels discerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister him. There's a lot to study in Jesus' temptation. Yes, they were serious, difficult, real temptations. Yes, he could have fallen and chosen any of them or any of another one, uh, any other infinite number of, of, of temptations in his life and fallen before God and failed. But I want to see how Jesus answered Satan. He not only answered him with Scripture... If you look in your footnotes or you look up these verses, he answered them out of the very verses we've just been reading. These, all three of the verses that Jesus used are are from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 8. The very point at which Moses, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, is now bringing his people into the promised lands. Jesus used those words after 40 days of fasting deal with the face-to-face temptations of life, of Satan himself. The first one was dealing with hunger. Who's going to provide for me? Will the Lord provide, or do I have to provide for myself? He was very hungry and could have had food at any time. The second temptation, will the Lord protect me? Will the Lord protect me, or do I have to watch out for myself? And he says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Attention, self-protection. And the third, temptation of, of power and wealth. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Who should be preeminent? Who shall be first in my life? These were issues of of provision, of protection, and of priority. And in all three cases, Jesus brings scripture and meaning into how he defeated Satan's temptations of sin and gives us an example of how we can defeat Satan's temptations towards sin. It is knowing who our God is, knowing his character, knowing 
uh, his prov provisions and his examples of provisions, knowing his protection, knowing where we've come from, knowing where we're going, that we can always trust him. Our meaning of life gives us answers for daily struggles. It's not just, ah, don't you lie. Don't you tell that lie. Don't you look, don't you, don't. It's not a list of do's and don'ts in Christ. It's a walk of meaning as disciples of our Lord. Jesus shows how powerful this moment of time is before the Israelites. How significant these words of Moses are in giving us clarity an explanation of who we are, whose we are, and where we're going. Before we wrap up, I want to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We'll wrap up there. It is so important to have meaning in our life. We have meaning from Christ, but many of us don't embrace it or see it or or participate in it. Realize how fundamental knowing uh, your God and knowing his purpose for you and knowing his provisions for you and knowing his eternity with you, how significant that is, makes to everyday living. A famous atheist, Aldous Huxley, I want to read a quotation from him, but I want to tell you who Aldous Huxley is for a second. His grandfather was Thomas Huxley. And Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog. Uh, Darwin was rather a calm, a quiet man. And it was Thomas Huxley who took, even though he disagreed, as it turns out, as I've been reading, he disagreed with many of, of Darwin's uh, conclusions and, and, uh, and, and uh, ideas, he took Darwin's evolution and popularized it. He brought it from society to society. He wrote about it over and over again. So that's Aldous Huxley's grandfather. Aldous Huxley's brother is Julian Huxley, a, a well-noted uh, uh, atheistic uh, evolutionist. Aldous Huxley wrote the novel Brave New World. Uh, probably his most famous thing, but he was a writer and a philosopher. And he wrote this in uh, ways, his uh, writing called Ways and Means. I had motive for not wanting the world to have meaning. I had assumed that there, it had none and was able without any difficulty to satisfy reasons for my assumption, for this assumption. To prove that there is no valid reason, I'm skipping a little bit, why one should not do as he wants to do, skipping down, for myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. Aldous Huxley writes and lived, as in his, in his uh, writings, as you can tell, uh, if you write, read his stuff, lived not to have a God. He did not want there to be a God. He did not want life to have meaning. Because if he could take the meaning out of life, then he was free to do what he wants to do. Most people go the other way around. Most people want to be free to do what they want to do, and so they just start there. And then they run into the incongruities of, of there being a God or there being something else, and, and then they sweep away the idea of God. Uh, or push him into the background, at least. Aldous Huxley knew that that would be a problem, so he brought the existence of God to the forefront, dealt with that, put no meaning in life, and then he said, I was free to sexual and political liberation. It is usually not the lack of evidence that people uh, don't believe in God. It's usually a particular desire of not wanting to submit to the hand and the guidance of an eternal being. 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, we'll see his hand and his guidance to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8. You shall remember, verse 2, all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, Jesus' quotation, but a man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out. Verse 5, thus you are to know in your heart that your Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there is no water and brought water for you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and might test you to do good for you in the end. On and on. The difficulties and challenges and pains and anguishes and tests and struggles in your life are not because God has forgotten about us, forgotten about you. We can't always know whether the hand of God or literally, as some scriptures say, the hand of Satan or, or what we've done to the earth itself. We live in a fallen world. Pollution and other things bring us problems. Driving too fast down the highway brings us problems. You cannot know the cause of the troubles in your life, but you can know your reaction to those troubles. That you turn to your God, and through your life, he disciplines us so that he could know and teach us what we need to learn. He gives us protective limits. He gives us uh, good deeds to do. He gives us things not to do. Please be careful. Don't go into this direction. Don't follow this idea. Don't feed selfishness, sexual promiscuity, etc., etc. It's going to hurt you. Nothing is greater than the relationships he's given us, and, and the pattern he gives us builds beautiful, strong, loving relationships. And so we try it our way, and, and uh, uh, we, a relationship or two or a part of our life comes crashing down around us, and we say, I shouldn't have done that. Our Heavenly Father loves us and is leading us through our lives that we might at times be humbled, at times be disciplined, but to know who he is. Know the meaning and purpose in your life. Know uh, that your heavenly father is active in your life. Know that he gives you, you the answers loud and clear of origin, of purpose, of morality, and of destiny. There's another side of meaning uh, that's more emotional, uh, wonder, truth, love, and security. And he answers all those two, but that's a totally different lesson. But be thrilled of the gift that our Heavenly Father has given us in Christ. 
the, the, the metaphor of what the people went through in the Old Testament is deliberate and clear. Go back and read uh, Deuteronomy chapters 1 through 10 uh, to see for yourself uh, and for your family. Thank you so much for your attention. We've gone a little bit over this morning. If any this morning would like to respond in faith, if any are ready uh, either to be baptized into Christ or to let the congregation know of a struggle in their lives that they need prayer for, Please remember in your prayers to pray for the, the Garrett family uh, who so suddenly lost uh, his mother. Uh, she has been ill for a while, but, but they did not expect her to pass. Uh, she was sitting in her living room when uh, she, her heart attack hit her. And, and pray for, for uh, Mike Reiner, who has now gone through two surgeries in the hospital to fix a mistake that was made. Uh, these men are in the times of struggle themselves. Um, but if it's any one of those kind of needs or anything else that we can help you with, uh, please come forward and let us know while we stand and sing.